Hello, my name is Corey Wren. I'm a professor of sociology, and I uh, also run the Vegan Feminist Network. And this is part of a three-part lecture on speciesism and sexism. Uh, if you want to go back and check out the first one first, uh, it covers uh, the gendered experience of non-human animals. So I look at the different ways that uh, animals are exploited based on their gender. And this one, I'm going to be looking more at intersectionality, how the oppression of non-human animals mirrors that of women, and also how they aggravate one another. All right, so the oppression of women and the oppression of non-human animals often overlap and reinforce one another. Um, and a lot of this presentation is going to be focused on um, some big theorists of intersectionality, like Patricia Hill Collins who's a sociologist, David Nybert, who's a sociologist, and also Carol Adams. Uh, this picture I took at a liquor store in Fort Collins, which is a big beer city. That's where I went to graduate school. And so you see it's called Raging Bitch, Belgian-style India Pale Ale. And if you look closely, you can see that the illustration of the dog has got like human breasts, and it's uh, so it's playing on the stereotype of women and it's also degrading animals at the same time. Intersections between women and non-human animals involves a culture of pleasurable consumption of consumable beings, and this is building on Carol Adams' theory. Um, basically, both animals and women are turned into things that can be consumed. Uh, so advertisements and pornography are constructed, constructed around uh, cueing arousal. So users learn to be receptive. Uh, we're not passive uh, recipients of media. We actually are being socialized by media. And attraction and desire are socially constructed. So the media, which is, again, controlled by uh, elite interests, and mostly white males who run the media, own the media, make decisions on the media. So we are being trained as a society how to react to this media, and we're being trained to view these vulnerable populations as consumable objects. So the consumption of the female and the non-human body often intersect. The two dominated minority groups are turned into things and they exist for male pleasure. And here's an example of a Carl's Jr. commercial or Hardee's for East Coast people in the U.S. Uh, think that I don't. That might be Jessica Simpson. Uh, I'm not sure, but a lot of their commercials will feature. Uh, famous women who are famous for their sexuality and there's one commercial that they have with Paris Hilton who is wearing a revealing bathing suit and she's riding around on a soapy car that she's supposed to be watch washing and eating a hamburger from Carl's Jr. or Hardee's. Hardee's is really notorious for uh, mixing the two, uh, objectifying animals and objectifying women at the same time and sexualizing the consumption of both. Uh, Burger King has also had a few commercials like that, and I'm sure you can think of lots of other examples. Carol Adams uh, has a book called The Pornography of Meat, and she has lots and lots of uh, examples in that book, and it's a really easy read, and I really recommend that one for anyone who's interested in these intersections. Here's some examples, though, that I've uh, found on the Internet. I think the T-shirt is actually from Carol Adams. Uh, we can, it says roasting fat ones since 1847. Uh, I can't remember which what this T-shirt came from, but it doesn't matter. I mean, obviously it's some kind of male gathering, and so you see women are conflated with animals, uh, where animals are sexualized and women are objectified. And so it's really difficult to disentangle them because they are so overlapping and they reinforce sexism and speciesism or like self-reinforcing. Uh, here's a dress. I don't think this is a Halloween dress. I think this is a regular dress. A woman dressed up like bacon. Again, she has been commodified as an animal product, so the, the notion here is that she's consumable, literally. And of course, non-human animals are rendered like absent and invisible. We don't even see them. It, it's just a piece of meat, and there's no likeness to an animal at all. So again, there's overlap in the commodification of both. And here is a picture uh, from a gas station where a woman is, it's a cardboard cutout of a woman with beef jerky attached to her. So again, we have the overlap where women are turned into consumable objects 
and animals are rendered invisible and of course they're also seen as consumable objects. So objectification is really important to understanding the intersection of speciesism and sexism. <clears throat> Both women and non-human animals are objectified in order to make them consumable. They're depersonalized. They become objects, then you no longer have to feel guilty about eating them, right, or consuming them. And this also relates to the absent referent notion. This is uh, Carol Adams. The absent referent means the separation of the person being consumed from the object being consumed. It's no longer someone, it becomes something. And the violence becomes, it's, it's hidden, it becomes invisible. All this is really necessary to facilitate, you know, the consumption where people don't have to think about the oppression that's involved. It makes the consumption more pleasurable, it makes it, um, without that guilt, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, pornography is also important here. <clears throat> what is pornography but the ultimate consumption of um, sexualized, objectified bodies? Pornography reduces women to meat. They're no longer seen as persons. They're butchered and consumed. And what butchered mean is, means is they're fragmented. Their body parts are fragmented. It, it's no longer like a whole person. Um, so these fragmented body parts become sexualized for, every, for the consumer's pleasure. So you'll see women in pornography tend to be interchangeable. And what that means is they just, they, there's this idealized type of uh, the commodified woman. She's hairless, she's got the perfect tan, she's usually blonde, and she's a certain thin body type, busty. And so it becomes about these objectified body parts and not about the person. <clears throat> So men are in control, women are seen as, or perform these submissive roles, and what this does is naturalize sexual dominance. So we see that throughout all pornography. And so what Carol Adams is trying to do is apply this notion to how we view meat. How do we view non-human animals? We turn them into meat, we no longer see them as persons, we butcher them, we consume them, we uh, fragment their body parts and sell them as fragmentations. and and it becomes sexualized. And so we saw that with the earlier slide where uh, the two were so overlapped that you know meat was presented on women's bodies and women were dressed as meat. And so we've naturalized that sexual dominance both for our relationships with women and with our relationships with other animals. Okay, so pornography also has certain scripts that um, teaches us how we're supposed to behave um, how, according to the gender that we uh, ident identify with, how we're supposed to uh, interact with others. And so what happens in pornography is there's this, this script of naturalized male dominance and women or feminized subservience. So the gender scripts we see in pornography is that men want sex and women are there to give sex or haven't taken. So the language of pornography is advertising, uh, it's man-to-man -man language. A fraternity of men is nurtured. So men experience themselves superior to women and entitled to them. So sex is about power. The public sphere is inundated with reminders that women are there that have distinct gender roles. And this is a really important aspect of pornography. It's not about just sexual gratification because we're we're socialized. Sexual attraction and is, is very socially constructed. So porn pornography is teaching us a specific story. It's teaching us that uh, getting turned on is is about power. It's about being able to dominate others, make them subservient. And so if we see pornography from this perspective, we can see how easily we can apply it to not just how we treat women, but also other feminized groups in our society, which would be people of color, uh, gay and lesbian people, uh, and non-human animals. So when we talk about this gender dichotomy, it's not just men versus women, it's masculinity versus femininity. So importantly, when we have the placement of non-human animals and images with women, that acts as a reminder that women are animal-like. And when we bring in the intersection of race, we really see that highlighted. Uh, this is a typo here. I meant to say African-American women are painted as having animalistic sexuality because, of course, women of color can entail a, a, a number of races. But specifically, uh, African-American women are really portrayed as being like um, very animalized. Um, 
have like a hypersexuality about them. Patricia Hill Collins has uh, written about this extensively, and I really recommend checking her out if you're interested in how race intersects with this. Um, but it's not just African American women, uh, Hispanic women, Latino women, Asian women. There's a lot of sexualized stereotypes about them. And of course, we see that big time in pornography. Um, and the pornography industry itself is extremely racist, I mean, not just for perpetuating these terrible stereotypes, but also uh, uh, women of color are much less likely to be hired, and when they are, they are paid a lot less. The intersections between women and other animals is in pornography, there's quite a few examples. Because again, sex is power. It's about power, not necessarily sexual gratification. So women are traditionally associated with caring for animals. And so uh, if sex is seen as power, and we know that women have this association with animals, and pornography is all about making, it's all about degrading women and humiliating women and demonstrating power over them, because that's what's defined as sexy. Uh, that's where these crush videos come from. And crush videos are where women in high heels or usually in high heels but not necessarily. They will torture and kill small animals. Um, they will crush them with their heels. They will make sure the death is really slow and painful. I know of one instance where a kitten was even microwaved. Um, so the point here is because sex is about power. Sex is about the masculine uh, domination over the feminine. What what's made what's sexy about crush videos is this ultimate demonstration of power over the vulnerable. So of course the number one vulnerability there is that the animals are being tortured and killed. So there's complete power over them. But men, of course, men are the ones who make ones who make pornography. It's a male-dominated industry. They're the ones who make it. They're the ones who profit from it. They're the ones who consume it. So what they're doing is they're exploiting this relationship, this traditional association between women and other animals. This this is being sexualized when they have women, they're so in control of women that they're able to make them break that bond and do something so horrific to these vulnerable animals. And also because women are stereotyped as being afraid of rodents, again, the power to make women overcome that and do exactly what they say is sexualized. So it's the domination and violence for both women and non-humans, both, both as feminized vulnerable groups. That's what crush videos are all about. And I know I recently have seen a meme that's been going around where it takes one of the women who were, was in one of these crush videos and they put her picture up and it, it was just a slit, thousands and thousands of so-called animal rights activists and vegans were commenting on that, calling her uh, all kinds of misogynistic words that I won't repeat here and wishing violence on her. And so that really misses the point because the point here is that crush videos are part of pornography. Pornography is about male violence, male domination of women and other feminized groups, which includes non-human animals and people of color. And so the woman herself is, is a victim of pornography. This is not women, a women's industry. This is a male industry. And so it, when we target women who are in these crush videos, what that is is victim blaming because women don't come into pornography because they're rational actors who... You know, this is a thrilling career to get into because pornography is very, very, very poorly paid. The average career is less than two years. It disproportionately is uh, attracting women from lower social statuses who don't have any other option. And it's a very high disease rate in the industry. It's not a glamorous industry at all. Most women only make a few hundred dollars for each movie that they make. So if we understand pornography to be about domination and uh, a display of masculine power over the feminized body, uh, Patricia Hill Collins is arguing that the origin of pornography then is linked to the objectification and sexualization of black women. If anyone has seen uh, 12 Years a Slave, uh, yes, that movie is about a male main, mayor, a male main character, but it is a supporting role of the woman that he encounters living on one of those plantations that really, that's really how the movie gets brought home, isn't it? And so you see how, that's just an excellent example of how violence against women, the domination of women specifically over brown women, and over the brown body, the ultimate objectified, oppressed body, it's been very sexualized. So you see one scene where she is stripped naked, 
to be whipped. There's rape scenes. There's the weird violence from the, the master, the white slave master. So Patricia Hill Collins is arguing that the, the slave industry and the exploitation of the black female body, that is where pornography as we know it today really originated. Of course, we've always had um, pornography in the basic understanding of the word. You know, there's medieval drawings of uh, people having sex. There's carvings in Hindu temples of people having sex. So technically, that's pornography. But por so por pornography became a record of acts done to women's bodies, first in slavery, but then with the advent of photography and film and digital media, we saw how um, this fragmentation, this uh, the subjectification had more lasting impact. Um, so long after women have been ob objectified, hurt, raped, beaten, now we have this image that's going to continue to revictimize and revictimize. It's out there. Um, so when you when you watch pornography, if you come across pornography, if you've ever seen pornography, many of those videos you're actually watching the literal literal rape and exploitation and violence against these women, and it's protected under First Amendment rights. Um, so what happens is the pornographer's freedom requires women's lack of freedom. Again, there's this, this um, conception of pornography as, as sex as power. Uh, women's harm becomes men's pleasure. Dominance is sexualized, and women are seen as inferior and animal-like. Uh, another part of this, um, of making this a natural process making it easily consumable, um, we do a lot of victim blaming. So women and non-human animals are depicted as wanting or deserving their consumption. And what this does is justify the behavior. So while women and non-human animals are socially and physically bound in the ways that they are institutionalized, uh, institutionally objectifi objectified and oppressed, we see them as free. We see them as free agents, even though they're really acting according to these institutional um, discriminations. So what this does is now we see the degradation and consumption as harmless and okay. There is a website called Suicide Foods. I think it's a blog actually, and this person has documented all the all these different advertisements where animals, as you see in this picture, uh, the pig who's just happy to be barbecuing himself. We see uh, in many advertisements we portray these animals as willingly killing themselves, willingly offering themselves up for food. They want to be eaten and. Uh, and we even see that in the excuse of why we continue to eat animals. We say, well, they would never be born if they had no, we had not raised them for food, or they live happy lives. And so we see a lot of imagery that really makes it seem like these animals are really asking for it. And a lot of other, another way that we victim blame animals is we say, well, they're stupid, or we evolved to be um, superior, so they deserve it in some way. And of course, we see the same thing with women. Um, one of the most common things that I hear when I speak critically about pornography is that women, um, they choose to be in pornography. They choose to make these decisions. They choose to go on the Girls Gone Wild and things like that. Well, for a lot of pornography, there's sex trafficking. There's women who have come from abusive households. There's a lot of domestic violence, child abuse, child molestation, uh, drug addiction. They're coming from really low uh, social classes. So for those women, there's, it's really difficult to say there's much choice there. And then, of course, there's a lot of sex trafficking that, trafficking that goes on with prostitution. So these women aren't eat, there's no choice at all. They're literally being pimped and trafficked. Uh, but then again, for women who seem to be making more rational choices, like with the Girls Gone Wild uh, example, uh, what's structuring that choice? It's, we live in a patriarchy where women are, their only value is seen in their sexual availability. So that's the only avenue that we're really granted to um, accrue any status. And so what we do though is we blame women for these institutional constraints because victim blaming makes it a lot more palatable. And it's about uh, normalizing and naturalizing this uh, hierarchy of domination. Again, uh, this normalization and internalization is really important to understanding uh, how this continues. Uh, one example is that if a fish could speak, water would be the last thing that she would identify as part of her environment because it's just everywhere. It's such a normal part of her life. And so 
women live in a sexual objectification the way the fish live in water. It's just something that is, we've always been around. It's since we were born in every aspect of our life, this, these, we are internalizing these expectations of what, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man, what sex is, uh, what food is. All these things, we're, just, we're socialized with these and we don't, we're not really conscious of them all the time. And so, of course, we see the animal rights movement. This is where I specialize. The animal rights movement, too, has internalized these norms of what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a man. And so, kind of strangely, while we're working to fight the objectification of animals, we seem to forget that we're also objectifying women in the very same way. And because these two intersect so much and they aggravate each other so much, it really makes no sense to say, well, it's not right to objectify animals, but we're going to continue to objectify women. So the animal rights movement is a little bit unique because we're mostly women. It's 80% women. Animal rights movement has traditionally been associated with nature. Um, one of the ways that women were able to uh, get out of the domestic sphere and into the public sphere is to exploit that, um, that stereotype that women are associated with nature and caretaking. And so that led us um, get out and start advocating for animals. Uh, women were some of the first important advocacy groups. They fought against uh, animal testing in the late 19th century. Um, when birds were going extinct for women's fashion, a lot of women's groups were uh, involved with fighting that. And of course today, 80% women. We're, it's a mostly female movement. So what happens though is because the movement is mostly male-led, like many social movements, men get uh, experience the glass elevator effect. They get put up into these prestigious positions, leadership positions. They, sit, they get to make the decisions. So women are becoming exploited um, under the presumption that they are naturally nurturing in order to participate. And then because most leaders are male, we have extreme sexism within the movement and from counter movements. And so there's been some sociological research that um, because the movement has been seen as female, depending on what campaigns they're going for, like the hunting campaign, because it's mostly men who hunt, and then it's mostly women who are protesting the hunt. You see a very gender division there. Um, there's a book called Brutal by Brian Luke that I highly recommend if you're interested in this dichotomy between male maleness and femaleness and animal rights activism. So from the counter movement, we experience a lot of sexism because they presume we're just a bunch of uh, silly women or hysterical women who are just too emotional. But on the other hand, the animal rights movement itself is pretty sexist in saying that women have two roles. You can be um, behind the scenes making the coffee and doing the boring, less prestigious work, or you can take your clothes off and you know, supposedly advocate against the objectif objectification of animals by objectifying yourself. Okay, so to summarize, human, female animals, and non-human animals are objectified and consumed in similar ways. Uh, women are often likened to non-humans and both are treated as objects. So a lot of times women are animalized and sexualized and a lot of times animals are sexualized and both both um, and feminized. And the point there is to make them, is to draw on this notion of feminiz femininity as inherently consumable and inherently lesser and sub um, easily dominated. So when we treat non-human animals like women, we treat women like animals it makes it easier to um, objectify them, consume them. And women are consumed not just, um, not, in the, not in the most straightforward way, like animals are literally consumed, but women are consumed um, in, in being consumed by, by the male gaze and as being victims of sexual harassment and sexual violence. So both minorities are sexualized and portrayed as willing providers, and we see a lot of victim blaming that goes on with that and a lot of naturalization of this hierarchy of domination. And pornography involves power. Remember, it's one of the important things here. Sex is about power. It's not just about you know, the biological reactions that we have. It's socially constructed. Sex is socially constructed to uh, normalize power relations. And so what happens is we link sexuality with dominance. And uh, Patricia Hill Collins has drawn on the history of slavery as one of the, if not the most important site where the origin of pornography as we know it today, um, with the sexualization of dominance over a feminized vulnerable body. Okay, so to leave you with some discussion questions, 
Uh, so you can be thinking about this in, um, before my last presentation for this comes up. Uh, probably uh, you'd want to think about what are the in intersections between species and gender because this is a very brief presentation. Uh, it can only touch on some of the many, 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 many intersections. And what are your thoughts on the origin of pornography? Do you think that it began, began, began with the black experience or did it precede it? And how does pornography impact black women today? And not just black women, but other women of color as well. Um, and consider how cow's milk has largely replaced human milk for nurturing human infants. Um, can you explain how that is connected? And I also want to recommend there is a book, um, not a book, a recent article that was published in American Quarterly uh, in 2013, uh, Greta Gard on post-colonialism and milk, and it explores all the intersections between animals and uh, animals and colonialism and race and class and gender, and it's a wonderful read. Thanks.